So when we're falling in love, chemicals associated with the reward circuits flood our brains. And this gives us a number of things that we recognize in love. The faster heart, the sweatier palms, the flushed cheeks, the feelings of passion and anxiety. When people talk about love being like a drug, this is what they have in common. But dopamine is only part of this equation. During this initial phase of romantic love, you also get more of the stress hormone cortisol, which essentially tells your body there's a crisis you have to deal with. And this is presumably why the person of your attraction can take up so much mental real estate. This is the object to be attended. And there's more. During that first swell of passion, there's a neuromodulator slash hormone called oxytocin that starts playing a big role. This gets released when we hug, when we cuddle, when we make eye contact. Oxytocin is released during sex and is heightened by skin-to-skin -skin contact. And it deepens these feelings of attachment and it makes couples feel closer to one another after having sex. And there are lots of other players like testosterone in men and women that seems to be heightened during this initial attraction. It's possibly associated with what makes desire feel urgent and what intensifies the physical attraction. In early relationships, high testosterone levels correlate with this intense attraction and with risk-taking behavior. Now, we put all this together and it gives us a little bit of insight into the old expression that love is blind. And that's because romance seems to also tamp down the neural pathways involved in fear and social judgment. In other words, when your heart's on fire, smoke gets into the neural machinery that's normally making critical assessments of the other person. That's why early stage love makes us overlook flaws, why it makes us idealize our partners, why we sometimes ignore red flags. Okay, so there are ways to study romantic love in the brain in terms of the circuitry and chemicals, but you can study the behavioral aspects as well. Who do we find ourselves attracted to and why? And what I've always found so wild is the way that our sense of attraction runs entirely under the hood. There's essentially no conscious awareness of any of it. You just find yourself attracted to some people more than others. The first Blushes of love feel like magic, but underneath the poetry, underneath the longing glances and racing heartbeat, attraction is a neural algorithm. Now, we generally like to believe that we consciously choose our partners, but a closer study tells us that our brains are making calculations we're not even aware of, pulling the strings behind the scenes. So, let's start with something visual, facial symmetry. A number of studies show that people across different cultures are more attracted to symmetrical faces. Why? One hypothesis is that symmetry is a marker of good genetic health. Through evolution, humans developed an unconscious preference for partners who show fewer signs of developmental instability. A more symmetrical face presumably means fewer genetic mutations, better resistance to disease, and a higher likelihood to produce healthy offspring. And it's not just symmetry. Certain features about other people are universally attractive, even across different cultures. Men are drawn to features that signal fertility, curvy body, high cheekbones, full lips, all things that young girls and older women don't have. Women tend to be attracted to different features, but the same idea, it's signals of fertility in the male. Things like strong jaw lines or prominent brow ridges, more rugged features are associated with higher testosterone, and it's signs that young boys and old men don't generally have. It indicates fertility. But attraction isn't only about appearance, it's also about familiarity. People often end up dating someone who looks just a bit like them. There's a reason for that. We are wired to find comfort in the familiar. In some cases, this means we unconsciously seek out people who resemble our parents because their faces are imprinted in our early neural development as safe and trustworthy. This is called positive assortative mating, which just captures the idea that we are often attracted to people who share our own physical or genetic traits. If you examine married couples, you'll find that they're more likely than chance to have similar eye colors, hair textures, levels of attractiveness. 
There are many reasons for this, things like implicit egotism, and there's individual differences in how much people want a mate to look like them. But on average, this is true. So while we think we're making independent choices in love, our brains are actually navigating us in patterns even when we don't recognize them. But attraction is about far more than what we see. It also involves what we smell. As I talked about in episode 89, humans, like all our animal cousins, communicate through pheromones, which are chemical signals that influence social and sexual behaviors. So while we have no conscious awareness of them, they play a role in determining who we find attractive. So one experiment on this was the sweaty t-shirt study, which was conducted by Klaus Wedekind and his colleagues. Women were asked to smell t-shirts worn by different men and rate which ones smelled the most attractive. The result was that the women preferred the scent of men whose immune system genes, what are called their MHC genes, were somewhat different from their own. In other words, the ladies were attracted to the guys who were not genetically similar to them. Why does this matter? Well, evolutionarily, choosing a partner with a different immune system means a greater variety of immune defenses for potential offspring. It's nature's way of preventing inbreeding and ensuring genetic diversity. Now, interestingly, birth control pills disrupt this natural process. There were experiments by Craig Roberts and colleagues that found that women who are on the pill are more likely to choose partners whose immune profiles are similar to their own. And that can be problematic because when they go off the pill, their attraction to their partner can sometimes change. So all this raises a question, to what extent is the attraction we feel out of our hands. If something as small as a birth control pill can alter our romantic preferences, what else is shaping our choices without us realizing it? Well, psychologists have long noticed that attraction isn't just shaped by these immediate biological factors, it's also shaped by our past. So researchers talk about three primary attachment styles that are formed in early childhood. And this influences how we approach relationships. So first, there's people with secure attachment, where they feel comfortable with intimacy. They tend to have stable, healthy relationships. But there's also anxious attachment, and people here crave closeness, but have a major fear of abandonment. They typically need a lot more reassurance in relationships. And then there's avoidant attachment. And here, people value independence to the point of pushing others away. They struggle with commitment. So when you see these different types, you start to see patterns when they combine in couples. For example, one of the most common and toxic relationship patterns is called the anxious avoidant trap. This happens when someone with an anxious attachment who craves closeness falls for someone with an avoidant attachment who fears closeness. And the result is this constant push and pull dynamic where one person chases while the other withdraws. Now, researchers have studied this kind of thing in brain scanning. And what they find is that people with secure attachment have more regulated activity in their prefrontal cortex, which presumably allows them to process emotions in a balanced way. But people with anxious attachment show a lot more activity in regions associated with fear and threat detection. So their brains are strongly wired up to detect potential rejection. And it's the same with people with avoidant attachment styles. They also have cranked up threat detection, but in this case, it has to do with being exposed to cues that trigger feelings of closeness. And they also tend to have less activity in reward centers for positive social stimuli. So sometimes the paths we take aren't about choices in the moment, but patterns set down in our brains long before we even enter the dating world. And attraction isn't just about biological signals and personality compatibility, it's also about novelty. Remember that the reward systems in the brain are heavily geared for novelty, for new experiences. This is why early stage romance feels so intense it's new and unpredictable and exciting. The brain gets a lot of dopamine hits when we're around someone that we're falling for. And it reinforces the sense of obsession and pleasure. 